Today we're going to talk about the pro prophetic message that is concealed in the Jewish New Year 5782, but I'm going to also take the Gregorian year, which will be in, in January the 1st, 2022, and show you how this ties together. For the first time, there's actually a match going on with both years. Now, a couple things that I want to introduce to you if this is a new system of uh, teaching that I'm going to be sharing with you some basic uh, background. The Gentile year begins January the 1st this next year and will start 2022. The Jewish New Year, New year began September the 6th through the 8th of 2021 and it kicked into the year 5,782. And we're not going to detail why there is such a difference between the Jewish New Year and the Gregorian year, but it's real interesting. The rabbis of Israel for hundreds of years developed systems. And I'm not just going to show you one, which I would normally do. I'm going to show you three phenomenal systems of how they believe that the Word of God, the Hebrew alphabet, and numbers can conceal things that can be understood during prophetic seasons. And I want you to say this with me. This works during prophetic seasons. And how many know we're in a prophetic season right now? The Hebrew alphabet, we probably have a chart we can show you. The Hebrew alphabet contains 22 individual letters and all are consonants and there are no vowels. The vowels are determined in modern Hebrew by dots and lines that are below the letters or above the letters and you get the I, E, U, O, O kind of sound, the guttural sounds from those. And uh, there are five final forms. In other words, five of those letters will be at the end of a word that finalizes uh, certain statements. Now, most of you already know this. This is basic teaching, but for those of you that are new, each letter of the Hebrew alphabet has a symbol of its own. The first letter is Aleph, and that is a symbol of an ox. The last letter is the Tav, and that is the uh, symbol of a cross, a plus sign or an X sign or a cross. And I've often pointed out that it all began in the Old Testament with animal sacrifices, but it concludes in the New Covenant with the cross of Jesus. So there's the ox and the cross. And by the way, that would be called Aleph and Tav, or better known in Greek as Alpha and Omega. The same first and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, of the Greek alphabet, the Alpha and the Omega. Each letter also has a number equivalent. I'm not going to go through all of these. It would take too long. But like when you see the letter Aleph, these numerical equivalent or the value of some call it is the one. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, one, two, three, four, five. And they actually goes all the way up to the 22nd letter that its numerical equivalent is 400. I'll have to show you that a little later on in one of the charts that we have. Now, what is interesting is the letters and the numbers can be interchanged. And this was done in the Roman time. This was done before the Roman time. They believe it actually started after the Babylonian captivity when the Jews returned from Babylon. The greatest example in the New Testament of how this system is used in the Greek, because the Greek alphabet also has numerical values, is when John wrote and said, let him count the number of the beast, for the number is 666. In the oldest Byzantine manuscript, though that 660 and 6 does not say 660 and 6. It is three Greek letters. And that first Greek letter totals 600 in value. The second Greek letter totals 60 in value. That third Greek letter in Revelation chapter 13 in the Byzantine manuscript that goes back way back hundreds of years ago is six. And that's where they get 666 because they take those three letters and total up the value, which is basically what John said to do. So this system that I'm showing you is not weird. It's not strange. It's not occultic. Some Christians have no knowledge of what I'm teaching and they think it's some kind of a weird mysticism. It really is not. It's very important because of what I want to tell you, it proves the inspiration of the Bible. And it also proves the Hebrew alphabet is the divine alphabet, probably the original alphabet and language that, that Adam spoke in the beginning of time. And I wish I had time to prove that to you from historical references. Now, uh, this is a type, what I'm going to show you would be a type of the Bible, a Bible code, not the kind that they use with computers where they skip different le uh, letters every seventh, every eighth, and they come up with words. That's a system that they came up with in 19. 
1988. I was one of the first people in Israel to see that system. It was in the newspaper in the Jerusalem Post before anybody wrote a book, before it ever went around the world. But that's not what we're going to deal with tonight. We're going to deal with something different. And I want to give you a quote, a quote about the Essenes. The Essenes were the men that lived in the Qumran Caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Israel. And here's the quote. The Essenes had a, the gift of prophecy. They had knowledge to give numerical values uh, to letters. They exchanged certain letters with opposite letters. They could not only predict the details of a sacred writing, but they could determine the exact time of the prophecy fulfillment with, acute ac with astute accuracy. Rarely, if ever, were their predictions proven wrong. And I remember the very first time I heard my guide Gideon Shore tell me, he said, do you know that in the Dead Sea Scrolls among the Essenes, it was predicted that Israel would be restored after 70 generations. And when Menachem Begin was living in Poland, as you know, he's a famous Israeli. When he was living in Poland as a little boy, uh, his dad was said, now when you, son, you will see See Israel restored as a nation. And he said, Daddy, how do you know that? He said, because I'm generation 69 from the captivity, you're number 70. And so help me if it did not happen in Menachem Begin's time. And that was a prediction, according to researchers, based on some of the evidence of the Essenes. Now, I want to also mention to you, because where we're going to go with this first example, and I tell you, these are fascinating. I love this stuff. How many of you like he breaks stuff? Raise your hand and wave at the, you wouldn't be following my ministry if you didn't like it. I tell you that for sure. But this is amazing. So let's look at this. The Torah, as you know, are the first five books of, the, of our Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were penned under the divine inspiration of God uh, by Moses in the wilderness. Now here's what the Jews say. They say all the scripture is inspired of God. Some was a vision, some was a dream, some was a visitation of an angel, some was a was a just an inspired word from a prophet. But they said here's what makes the Torah different. It says in the Torah, the five books of Moses in our Bible, and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, and it says here's the difference. A prophet would come under inspiration and write under inspiration. Moses wrote, wrote what God dictated to him by his mouth. In other words, it was written by God speaking the words audibly to Moses and Mo just like a secretary would the boss, every letter, this, you gotta hear this, every letter is where it's supposed to be. Every word is where it's supposed to be. And so this is why what I'm going to show you works. This is because the divine inspiration of God actually speaking audibly to Moses he had every letter in place. He had every word. Because I like what Dr. Cutshaw says when he teaches. He says that the scriptures many times have layers to them and it's like an onion and you peel away one layer and you see something else in that verse and then you'll see something in that word and then that word will agree with that word over there. And so what I want to talk to you about is just, for just a moment is this that we have an actual Torah scroll which was given to me by a wonderful lady who passed away and I will not use her name. She's a very famous, wealthy Jewish lady and she got me a Torah scroll that was 300 and some years old. Now, lest my Jewish audience gets upset that a Gentile owns a Torah scroll, it's a, a non-kosher scroll. Now, what does that mean? It means that the letters have been smeared over the years. It came out of Russia, but the letters have been smeared and once it's not readable, it is then and buried and taken care of just like an actual bear. It's never burnt, never destroyed. So we were able to obtain one of these through her because once it's not readable, you either have to go through, which would just be very difficult to do, and put the ink back or they actually take them and treat them like a human being. When this Russian synagogue was burning with this scroll, they ran in and rescued this scroll because they treat it like a living person. They say the Bible is a living thing. How many of you believe the Bible is a living thing? The Word of God, all the Word of God, all 66 books is a living thing. Well, it's interesting that on that Torah scroll, it's just letter after letter after letter after letter after letter. There are not on an original scroll of the five books any uh, uh, letters like verses. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5. All right. The chapters 
in the Torah, because that's what we're going to deal with for a few moments, were added in the translation in A.D. 1227 by Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So in our Bible, in our Bible, our Bible, see those chapters and verses were added in the year 12, uh, 1227. And you add the verses based on the, where the thought changes. There is a statement, then the next statement is a little different, and the next statement is a little different. And that's why the verses are longer, some are shorter, is because they very carefully made sure that they watched the statements and in the context of each uh, chapter, etc. Now, the Wycliffe Bible of 1382 was the first to use the chapters with all the headings. So this tells you how far back this goes. Now, the Hebrew Bible, which again was written in the Hebrew, Hebrew language was later divided into chapters and verses in 1448 by someone named Rabbi Nathan. So this is how far back it goes. Now we have in our Bible the chapters and the verses that are parallel to the chapters and the verses of the Hebrew scriptures. So keep that in mind. So there's no contradiction there. Now the individual letters, the individual letters of the Hebrew alphabet, remember there's 22, all have a numerical value and and the numerical value can often match a verse. First of all, let's look at this list. I hope we have this. Uh, we're going to talk about how the years, the years of a Jewish year, an actual Jewish year on the Jewish calendar, can be translated into the verse number in the Torah, the actual number of verses that are there. Now, to understand it, you've got to look at the five books of the, Bi of the Bible. The book of Genesis has 1,533 verses. Exodus has 1,213 verses. Leviticus has 859 verses. The book of Numbers has 1,288 eight verses, and Deuteronomy has 959 verses. Now, I'm very dyslexic with numbers, so I hope I just read that right. Your screen will tell, tell you the proper number. That is a total of 5,852 verses, 5,852 verses. Now, what if we took the verses in the Torah, we start with Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God made the heavens earth, and we go all the way to the very last verse of Deut Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, last verse of Deuteronomy, very last verse there. That would mean we start with Genesis verse 1, and we go all the way 5,852 verses later, we come to the very end of the book of Deuteronomy and the very last verse that's there. But what if we were to take the verse Verses, all right, and say, okay, could the Jewish year on the Jewish calendar match that same verse number? Does this make sense what I'm telling you? Well, maybe I just need to show it to you. Here's a code, the code. The Jewish year 5,708, if we go to the 5,708 verse in the Torah, the verse number, it's Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 5, and here's what it reads. And the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land which your fathers possessed, and ye shall possess it, and will do you good and multiply you above your fathers. Right, cool verse, right? But let me look at that verse again, and let me tell you that that, that verse in the Torah right? The year 5,708 is our calendar year, 1948. Uh, now you're getting it. Now you're seeing where we're going. So in other words, in, in that verse, the 5,708th verse in the Torah matches our Gregorian year of 1948. What happened in 1948? God brought Israel back as a nation into the land of their fathers on May 14, 1948. And he said, I'm doing that to do you good. Well, it gets more interesting as you go along because if we take the 5,712th verse in the Torah and we count it and say, what verse is that? It's Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 9, which matches 1952 on our calendar. Here's what that verse says. And the Lord thy God shall make thee plenteous in the works of thy hand, in the fruit 
of thy cattle in the fruit of the land for good. The Lord will again, there's your key, again rejoice over you as he rejoiced over your fathers. Now, why is that date, uh, 1952, important? Because there was a man by the name of David Ben-Gurion. And David Ben-Gurion is called the father of modern Israel. He is the one that stood in Tel Aviv and he announced with a partition that, that Israel was restored as a nation and gave it the name of Israel. Well, there's a very famous picture of him standing there with a group of Jewish elders announcing in 1948 that Israel was a nation. But let me tell you what David Ben-Gurion did. He was also a farmer, and he is the man that in 1950, 50, 51, and 52, and 53, he began to go into the Negev Desert, which was nothing but dust and dirt, and he began to irrigate it, and the land began to blossom. Watch this. And they brought cattle in on this land, and the tree Trees began to be planted in the land. So in other words, 1952 was a central year where Ben-Gurion did this. God said, I'll bless the work of your hand. God said, I'll bring the cattle back in the land. God said, I'll cause the land to be fruitful. And God said, I will again rejoice over you, O Israel. Isn't that amazing? So the, the Jewish year, 5,712, matches the verse in the Torah 5,712th verse, which comes out on our calendar to 1952. But here's another one. The 5,727th verse is the year 1967, 1968, and this one's wild. And it brings us to, in the Torah, Deuteronomy 31 and verse 4 in the Bible. Let me read it to you. It says, and the Lord will go before thee and will destroy those nations from before thee and you shall possess them. Now this is important, watch this. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sihon the, and to Og, the king of the Amorites and unto the land of whom he destroyed. Now check this out. That year, on the, okay, 5,727 Jewish calendar, 5,727 verse in the Torah is 1967-68 in our calendar. Now, why is that important? Ready? Because in 1967, during the Six-Day War, the Israelis got the Golan Heights back, and guess who lived in the Bashan, or better known as the Golan Heights, two giants, one by the name of Sihon and the other by the name of Og. Come on, somebody, you're gonna get it in a minute that's mentioned in this verse of scripture that matches the year on the Jewish calendar and the year on the Gregorian calendar when the Israelis went up into the Golan Heights and captured the land of Og and the land of Sihon. They did it in the time of Moses and they did it in 1967 during the Six Day War. Somebody give the Lord a hand. The inspiration of the Bible. It's absolutely incredible when you look at it. The verse for 5,746 is the year 1986. It's Deuteronomy 31 and 23. That verse that matches those two years on the Jewish and Gregorian calendar reads thus. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge and said, be strong and of good courage for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land which I swore unto them and I will be with you. Okay, now God is saying here, okay, the children of Israel are outside the land but I'm going to now bring them back to the land. Well, guess what started happening in 1984 which matches that year on the calendar, Jewish calendar, which matches that year of the verse of the Torah, something called Operation Moses began. Mm. Operation Moses, and it went from 1984 to 1985, and there were 6,500 Ethiopian Jews that were airlifted back to Israel, and it started, it started the return of the Jews that year that eventually led to 1987 Russian Jews beginning to be released, and now literally way over a million Russian Jews have returned. Hundreds of thousands of Jews have returned around the world, and here's my point, don't miss it. It it starts in 1984, which matches what God says, I'll bring the children of Israel back to, is anybody getting excited besides me? I'm telling you, this is the kind of stuff I love. Now, you say, well, I want to know about the year which is coming up. We're going to get to that. 
But now I'm going to show you a second code that was used by Rabbi Menachem Schneerson. And you got to say his name right, Menachem, but I, I'll do it simple for you uh, Gentile folks sitting out here. <laughs> but Menachem Schneerson was the head rabbi of one of the Orthodox movements in Brooklyn, New York. Now, the odd thing is he lived to be in his 90s, and there were people that, in Brooklyn that thought he was the Messiah. Of course, he wasn't. But he'd never been to Israel. They were building him a house in Israel that looked like his home in Brooklyn to actually, for the first time in his life, bring him to Israel. But I was told by Israelis, Menachem Sneershin could sit in New York and Brooklyn and control the Israeli election among the Orthodox Jews in Israel. This was the influence that this man had. He did something very unique. Now, I'm going to have to try to explain this to you, and I hope I can do this in time. If we took 1947 to 1948, it's the year 5,708. Sneerson would take the five, and the five would be the letter hey. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, hey. It's the letter hey. All right? And then he would take the 700, and he said, okay, if we take 700, there's no value of 700 in any Hebrew letters. Let's divide it up. 400 is Tav, Shin is 300. So then he would say, okay, hey, Tav, Shin. And then the last letter of uh, the, is the, the, or should I say the last number is the number eight in the Hebrew alphabet. The eighth letter is uh, the letter Chet. So he said this, He, Tav, Shin, Chet. And then he formed this acrostic and he predicted this. Now watch this. 1947, 48, Jewish year 708 is, quote, Ha Tekufa Shel Chavil, the season of the birth pains. What happened in 48? Israel became a nation. Shall a nation be born as once when Zion travailed, she brought forth her children, Isaiah said. In 35 years of hosting the main event, which is America's yearly camp meeting, this year's gathering was declared by 4,000 attendees to be the best yet. I was inspired to release new prophetic downloads the Lord gave me, including messages exposing satanic plots that are now distracting you. All of the morning speakers shot the arrow of God's revelation right on target to help us through these difficult times. On the opening night, I unlocked the concealed prophetic message in the Jewish New Year 5782 and the coming Gregorian year 2022. I also detailed how the verse numbers in the Torah actually coincide with the exact Jewish year when these predictions occurred. You can see this on our DVD message. This is a stunning Hebraic revelation. There is a new demonic principality dominating American culture and politics that I expose in the message. The third exodus, America is fighting the Ramses spirit. Ancient history is now repeating itself. Discover the strange and future ancient patterns now taking place across America. The message called Programming Americans to Accept the Mark of the Beast will explain how the masses are being set up right now to submit their freedom to the global elitist who will use future pestilences, diseases, natural disasters, and food shortages in an attempt to seize control of economic power. Using details from ancient narratives, I'll walk you through the Bible and my own personal experiences in the message when Satan's ambush becomes your worst day. Satanic strategies work through personalities that create an hour of testing. Follow the playbook of the enemy, unlock his thinking, and discover how to reverse the decision Satan has made against you and your family. My fifth message was a new message called Satan's Greatest Secret Now Exposed. Folks, this is one message your adversary hopes you never hear. This revelation literally transformed my faith, my hope, and gave me strength in a time of great weariness. You have to hear this powerful word. Jensen Franklin preached it's time to write another chapter. Shut the book on your past and write a new future. After hearing this word from God, you will do just that. Tommy Bates came in a morning service and thrilled us with his faith-building message, The Angels Are Coming. The message, which also included incredible faith-building stories, brought thousands to their feet, weeping, rejoicing, and shouting. This message will set you free from fear and anxiety, without a doubt. Listen to the revelation by John Kilpatrick. What if prepare for the end-time deception? This astonishing expose is one of the most needed messages for the entire body of Christ in this season. Now, you can order all of these eight messages on CD or the DVD. The CDs are the unedited messages, and the DVDs are also unedited. 
but the DVDs also include the PowerPoint pictures that you can see that I use. The CDs are $55 and the DVDs are $95 a set. They come in a beautiful album. The offer number for CDs is 21ME-CD. The DVD offer number, as you see on the screen, is 21ME-DVD. I want you to order right now at perrystone.org or call toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. I promise you this, this will be one of the best set of messages you have heard in some time. Your purchase goes to keep manifest on the hair. I'm waiting to hear from you. Thank you for joining me. Now listen to me very carefully. This offer is the main event. 4,000 people said to us, and I mean, it was all over the place. They were going to our staff, to Pam, to myself, to Charlie, and they said, you tell Perry that of all the ones we've ever attended in the history of the ministry, this one has been the greatest move of the Spirit and the greatest, most significant messages we've ever heard. Please take the time to invest in your walk with God, your spiritual growth, and get either the DVDs or the CDs of the main event. And we never show the morning speakers on TV because we just we just stick with what we're preaching, basically, or I'm preaching. But you're gonna, I promise you this, you're gonna learn, you're gonna be blessed, encouraged, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words are gonna come forth that you're gonna receive, it's gonna be a help to you. Another thing that I wanna share with you is some of you may be aware of the fact, and may not be, that we are hoping to build a legacy center and then a very large Holy Land Relic Museum. And these are some of the relics. Uh, we're, we have clearance through the Israeli Museum. Every one of these has a number. It's verified by the Israeli Museum. And let me, let me tell you, and I know that some of you that do museums are gonna say, put gloves on, why do, why do you have that on the table? But look, this dates back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the time of the patriarchs. All right, beautiful design. And I've got other pieces. We just put these here for decorations. Trust me, we're taking care of these in an exclusive place. But we're gonna build this, this relic museum. And we're gonna go through, the, start with the Torah. I have a 300 year old Torah scroll that's been given to me. We have a model of the entire city of Jerusalem and olive wood that would fill up a room. We have thousands of relics and we're gonna be going through these. And when this building is built, we will have right here in the southeastern part of the United States, a major place that church groups, youth groups, individuals and families coming right off the interstate here in Cleveland can come by and watch this and see this. Some of this stuff is absolutely incredible. If you would like to help us just to get this built or help us with the building and get us get a donation to us for that it would mean a lot and we will you'll you'll have a little bit of a legacy here for generations to come or till the lord tarries uh to be able to help young people and people of all ages to see the bible is the inspired word of god and i don't want to tell you everything that's going to be in it but i want to tell you we're excited about it we believe the lord has put it in our heart to build it right on the property here the architects are already making plans. They're talking to people that do museums. So uh, you can contact our office at, at Perrystone or perrystone.org. And we would love to uh, hear from you. And you say, you know what? We want to be a part of the museum, Holy Land History Relic Museum in Cleveland, Tennessee. Thank you for your prayers and time. God bless you.